Well, welcome everybody to our festival of Easter, this Easter Sunday evening. Uh, there's a crash downstairs, there's a junior program also for uh, primary school kids, so don't miss out uh, on that. And uh, don't miss out afterwards, do stay behind, there's refreshments and uh, plenty of opportunity to meet and to chat. We've got ahead of us this evening a program of uh, poetry and song, some of it uh, performed for us, some of us for us to join in, uh, as well as, of course, uh, a focus on the Easter message from John's Gospel. And it's all about the hope that we can trust our future to. Before we sing together, though, listen to the words of an Easter hymn from a way back in the 6th century, which tells why the message of that first Easter morning is one of such happiness. Welcome, happy morning. Age to age shall say, Hell today is vanquished, heaven is won today. See, the dead is living, God forevermore. Him, their true creator, all his works adore. Welcome, happy morning, age to age shall say. Maker and redeemer, life and health of all, you from heaven beholding human nature's fall. Of the Father's Godhead, true and only Son, Adam's race to rescue, Adam's form put on. Hell today is vanquished, heaven is won today. Author and sustainer, source of life and breath, you for our salvation trod the path of death. Come then, true and faithful, now fulfill your word. On your own third morning, rise, O buried Lord. Welcome, happy morning, age to age shall say. <laughs>
Well, that uh, triumphant hymn goes back even further, as you see, to St. Columba. And that's a reminder that Christ Jesus has been worshipped here in this land uh, since very ancient times. And he still makes people like us sing with joy today. Now, our choir uh, is now going to sing a much newer song, but still rejoicing in the power that raised him from the grave and which now works in us also so powerfully to save. Then we'll hear another poem which reminds us, although none of us were there to see with our own eyes uh, the events of Christ's death and resurrection, we can believe because those who did witness it with their eyes didn't keep it secret. They proclaimed it to the whole wide world. And then we'll hear how somebody who was born in a country very far from here, how they came to know Jesus uh, just as we have done. And then Joel Tay is going to sing a song about the many mysteries that attend our extraordinary salvation, but also the wonderful certainties that we can know through Jesus, our Savior.
we were not there to see you come to this poor world of sin and death, nor did we see your humble home, your hidden life in Nazareth, but we believe your footsteps trod its streets and plains, O Son of God. We did not hear you teach the wise and preach to crowds in Galilee, nor watched you healing ears and eyes of those who could not hear or see. But we believe you came as light to sinners lost in darkest night. We did not see you lifted high or feel the taunts they flung at you, nor were we there to hear your cry, forgive, they know not what they do. Yet we believe the deed was done which shook the earth and veiled the sun. We did not stand beside the tomb upon that resurrection day, nor meet you in the upper room, nor walk with you along the way, but we believe the angel said, why seek the living with the dead? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Joe and I'm from India. Uh, I have been in Glasgow for a year and I came here to do my master's in chemical engineering. Uh, I grew up in a Christian family. Uh, I can remember going to church and Sunday school as long as I remember and I did a lot of things but I did them uh, as uh, a means to uh, please God uh, as something to get what I want out of my life. Then I think I'm really grateful to God for sending my uncle. Uh, he was probably the uh, f first person who introduced me to the teachings of uh, R.C. Sproul. Uh, he's probably my uh, favorite theologian, I would say. And uh, it was probably listening to one of uh, his uh, videos where he talked about uh, a God who is holy, a God who is just, and a God who is ultimately good, uh, a God who is sovereign over everything that happens in the universe. He also spoke in that video about how we, we as human beings are bad. Uh, I never really considered a life from that perspective. I always paraded myself as someone who is good. I always, even though I knew there was sin in me, I always considered myself to be, uh, I considered uh, that I was better than most people around me. But in the sight of a holy and just God, we are all sinners and God is ultimately good. And that was uh, probably the first time uh, uh, when I felt that I was in need of a savior. I felt that it was not in what I do, it's not in my, uh, abilities or in my uh, desire uh, to do things, but it's God in His grace who offers uh, me forgiveness. You know, apart from all these things that I've spoken so far, uh, death is something that we are all scared of. Uh, right before the pandemic, I saw one of my uh, classmates, someone that I used to associate with on, on a daily basis. He, he passed during the summer of uh, 2019. And, and that was a shock to all of us as students. Uh, uh, and it was, it really made, made us question about the meaning to life. And there, there is an anxiety that people do experience when they have to deal with the question about death. Uh, but as Christians, as someone who, uh, as a Christian and someone who believes in uh, Jesus and his life and his death on the cross and his resurrection, uh, I know that even in the midst of all these uncertainties uh, and difficulties, 
uh, that we uh, that I experience on, on a daily basis with with regard to uh, my career and what the future holds, how long I'm gonna live, and when I'm gonna die. Uh, I have a sure hope uh, in knowing Jesus that He is living. He He is reigning, and He was reigning. He is reigning, and He will reign. And he will come back, and he will make all things right. And that is the hope for me personally. Uh, it's not wishful thinking, positive reinforcement, or uh, you know, keeping my fingers crossed and you know, taking a, a leap into darkness. But it's rather taking a leap into light. Satisfy the needs and aspirations of East and West, of sinner and of sage. But this I know, all flesh shall see his glory, and he shall reap the harvest he has sown. And some glad day. Shine in splendor when he, the Savior, Savior of the world, is known. I cannot tell how all the lands shall worship when at his bidding every storm is stilled. Or oh, who can say how great the jubilee? When all our hearts with love for him are filled. But 
but this I know, the skies will sound his praises. Ten thousand, thousand human voices sing, and earth to heaven, and heaven to earth will answer. At last, the Savior, Savior of the world is King. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her.
on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in the, his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, you have believed because you have seen me. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Do keep those words uh, open in front of you. I want to uh, talk about them this evening. I want to talk about the unique currency that you must invest in to secure the future that you really long for, a currency that you can trust as the key to life. I'm not talking about Bitcoin, by the way. But listen to how the Harvard financial historian Neil Ferguson describes money. He says, money is a matter of belief, even faith. Belief in the person paying us, belief in the person issuing the money. Money is, he says, trust inscribed. Trust inscribed. He tells us that the earliest forms of money were uh, clay tablets with a written promise on them to hand over uh, grain uh, at harvest time. It's what today I suppose we would call a, a futures contract. And you would accept that tablet in payment for, well, let's say, a sheep today if you trusted your counterparty to be good for that grain at harvest time. And you wouldn't accept it, I guess, if you didn't trust them to be good on delivery. And it's no different today, really. The, the currency markets, the bond markets, are what really tell you what is going on with a, currency, with, with a, a, a government finances, because currency traders and bond traders, they're not fools. They're pretty hard-headed. They allocate capital to uh, make gains and to prevent losses. And so they will examine the evidence in a very hard-headed way. They're very skeptical of a government's financial promises. They won't just believe what a government says, they will examine their actual actions. They'll pass judgment on whether they really feel they can place their faith, place their trust in that government's currency and its bonds. And they'll base that not upon a government's financial promises, but upon its proven fiscal prudence. That's why when there's a crisis in the world, there's always a flight of capital to US dollars, not to Zimbabwe dollars. Because they trust that a US dollar will be worth something in a month's time, whereas a Zimbabwe dollar might be worth a cent in a month's time. Some of you will remember the 
hyperinflation there. I've got in the house somewhere a billion dollar note, but unfortunately, it's a Zimbabwe dollar, not a US dollar. Mind you, even the very hardest of currencies do lose value over time. If you had a, a US dollar 100 years ago today, it would actually only be worth a cent uh, today. But it's lasted a bit longer than the Zimbabwe one. But you see, a currency's value is all a matter of faith. It's a matter of trust. And it's based on hard evidence. It's based on reality. It's based on something that careful people, sane people, intelligent people can weigh up and act upon. And that does tell you actually why today more and more uh, nation's central banks and big investors are turning to gold, not to paper currencies, even hard currencies, because they don't trust uh, governments, even the US government, uh, and all the vast debt that they've been accumulating. It's all a matter of trust. And it's the same, isn't it, on a personal level. I'm sure that you will hope that whoever is managing your pension fund is investing it based on something that is credible, not credulous. Because if it isn't, then your retirement is at risk. You don't want your fund manager, do you, to just be taking a leap in the dark. You want their decisions to be based on sound evidence, on observable reality. You want them to exert sound judgment, credibility. You want to be able to trust where your money's going. Well, how much more important to know what currency investment you can trust when the stakes are not just uh, comfort and prosperity in retirement, but when the stakes are for all eternity. When what's at stake is nothing less than heaven or hell. And see, the question that Easter poses for every single human being is whether you trust the currency of the Christian gospel. Because it is the trust inscribed in that message that will prove to be the only currency with any lasting value in the great crisis that is certain to come. And that crisis is the judgment of Almighty God. Christian faith, you see, as Joe said in his testimony, is not a leap into the dark. It's not the spiritual equivalent of the Zimbabwe dollar. It's quite the reverse. It is what solid gold is, in fact, to every paper currency. It's trust in something that is solid, that is tangible, that is real, that is lasting, that can never be devalued, that can never be rendered absolutely worthless. Because behind it stands not, well, not the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or the European Bank or anything else, but Almighty God Himself. So I want to talk this evening about this currency of Christianity, the message of the risen Jesus, and the trust that is inscribed in these words of witness to those who from the very beginning claim to testify to the clear and credible reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus. There's just no place at all uh, for leaps in the dark based on, on emotions, based on hunches, not at all. What we want to do as a Christian church is, is to urge people to examine the evidence with all their faculties. But equally, of course, there's surely also no place for, for a closed-mindedness, an intransigence, a refusal to consider even being open to persuasion by compelling truth, if it can be demonstrated. You see, if the currency of Christianity is, in fact, the only store of value for eternity, what a calamity what a calamity it would be if you had been given the chance to buy in, to invest freely, but, but you'd refuse to do so because but you just never really bothered to take the evidence seriously when it was put in front of you. Imagine that is actually how people who some years ago were offered 100 Bitcoin for a dollar and who scoffed and refused it. I bet you they will feel pretty sick today when that's worth something like $6 million. But how much more... How much more if you had been offered something of infinite value, freely, and yet you'd scoffed and you'd closed your mind and your unbelief had prevented you receiving something, even investigating something that would utterly transform your life, not just now, but forever and ever. That is what nearly happened to the great skeptic Thomas that we read about there at the end of this passage in John 20. 
That's what would have happened to him had it not been for the extraordinary patience and generosity of God. But Thomas's story is preserved for us both as a warning but also as an encouragement because it's here to point us to not make the mistake that he did at first. Look, look at the first paragraphs there uh, on your sheet in John uh, chapter 20, verses 24 and 25 of that last section, because what we see here is a, a picture of a very common situation, and that is of a great cynic. What you see there in verses 24 and 25 is Thomas, the skeptic who rejects the evidence of the risen Jesus. I will never believe, he says. Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. I will never believe. Now remember what these previous sections that were read to us have told us. This account is full of evidence. And it's passed on by, by reliable witnesses, entirely trustworthy people, known sources to these others. Look at the very first paragraph in verses 1 to 10. We have the evidence here of the, the sprinting fishermen, Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest disciples. They ran to the tomb, verse 4 says, and John outran Peter. He must have been training harder. But he didn't go into the tomb, but Peter did straight away. And verse 6 says, he saw, he saw the evidence of grave clothes still in place, untouched, and yet the body gone from inside them. And then, verse 8, we're told the other disciple, John, goes in and he saw, and he believed. And notice verse 9, it's very interesting. Why did they believe? Not because they understood the scriptures and were expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. We're told they didn't yet grasp that. They didn't understand. Why did they believe? They believed the evidence in front of their own eyes, showing them something they never expected, did not expect at all, were utterly surprised by, but could not deny. And then in verses 11 to 18, we have the same evidence from sorrowful Mary. Mary's weeping. Why is she weeping? Because she's not looking for a living Jesus. She's looking for a dead Jesus, a dead body. But then she hears his real voice. And she sees him with her eyes. And she clings on to him so much that Jesus has to try and peel her off. And verse 18, look at her evidence. I have seen the Lord. And she's heard his voice and passes it on. And then verse 19, we have more evidence still. The testimony of all these uh, scared disciples. They're all together. All of them hear his voice. All of them see his, his feet his hands, his wounded side. They feel the breath of his mouth. And so when Thomas appears later, they say to him in verse 25, you see, we have all seen the Lord. We've seen him. <laughs> and Thomas says, do you think I came up the Clyde in a banana boat? Are you kidding me? Don't be ridiculous. Dead people don't come back to life. We all know that. See, skepticism did not begin with people like Richard Dawkins and so on. If you listen to people like him, you would think, well, all these people in the past were, were complete fools. They were simpletons. They would believe anything at all. That's absolute nonsense. The whole point of this description is to point out, as all the Gospels point out, that the resurrection was very hard to believe, and they didn't believe it at first, because that sort of thing does not happen. And they only believed it on the basis of utterly convincing evidence, irrefutable evidence. But at this point, you see, Thomas was having absolutely none of it. Unless I see, I will never believe. And I think we can understand that, I guess. Probably most of us would have been exactly uh, the same. But just think for a minute. Think for a minute if we, if we applied that attitude to every aspect of life. Think what it would mean for life. It would mean that we were never trusting of anything that's vouched for by another person ever, however trustworthy, unless we saw it for ourselves. We wouldn't take anything at all on trust. 
Well, that would stop our world going round, wouldn't it? Couldn't have money for a start, could we? Because money is trust inscribed. Using money is trusting somebody's word that we can't see. So, so all trade, all commerce, all human interaction would have to grind to a halt. If we said, I'll never believe. Actually, that's what does happen, isn't it? In a, in a credit crunch, as we saw some years ago. When governments, when banks no longer believe the word of other banks about what assets they really have and so on, well, they won't lend to one another. They'll do a Thomas. They'll say, well, unless I see your capital, I'm not going to lend any to you. And when that happened, the whole world system broke down, didn't it? Trust broke down because the word credit comes from the word credere, which means I trust. And in the credit crunch, nobody could trust anybody else in the financial world. Well, of course, there was good reason for that, wasn't there? Because uh, their words weren't true and their assets were toxic and uh, it was pretty disastrous. But that's just one example, isn't it, about how the whole of life actually depends on being able to believe the words and the witness of other people when they give a reasonable explanation of facts and when they're credible, when they're reliable as witnesses. That's how we decide the truth about, about almost everything. Think about a court of law. So there's a murder trial, and the case hangs on the testimony of the witnesses. And imagine hearing five first-hand witnesses giving testimony. And they say, yes, Your Honor, I saw that man killing that man. And the next witness, yes, Your Honor, I saw that man killing that man. Five times. And the judge directs the jury towards a guilty verdict. But the jury man stands up and says, no, we've discussed this, my Lord. And unless all of us saw it with our own eyes, we will never believe that he did it. Well, that would be preposterous, wouldn't it? Our whole justice system would collapse <laughs> if that's the way we worked. Well, think about trying to buy something over the internet. You go onto Amazon, you need a new computer. So you read all the description, you read the pictures and all the rest of it. You read all the, the customer reviews. But then you pick up the phone and you phone up Amazon and you say, well, I want to buy this computer, but I want to see it with my own eyes and touch it with my own hands before I buy it. And they say, well, it's impossible. You can't do that. It's in the warehouse. And you say, well, I'm not going to buy it then. But then you think about it a bit and you, you decide to phone a friend who bought one of these computers and you phone him up and he says, yeah, it's great. And I received it absolutely on time. It's terrific and so on. So you say to yourself, okay, I, I trust my friend John. I'm going to buy this computer. So you go, you go back to Amazon and you order online. And a box doesn't come up, does it, and say, oh, sorry, we need to see your cash in our hand before we're going to send this to you. In fact, we need to have actually spent that cash on something else to make sure that it really works before we even fulfill your order. No, that's not what happens, is it? You give your credit card, your trust card, and you believe that the retailer will send your order. And they believe that the card company will pay the bill for the order. And the card company believes that you will pay them at the end of the month. The whole transaction is based on trust. Trust in the word and in testimony that is credible, that's believable. Not credulous. But credible because, well, in the first place, the card provider is only going to give you a card if they've checked the evidence of your track record and your credit score and all the rest. That's how life works, isn't it? We trust based on a reasonable credit score, based on a trustworthiness score, and all manner of things in life. Now, here is Thomas receiving firsthand, reliable, utterly consistent evidence from numbers of people who he has known, who he knows he can trust, and who he should have trusted. And yet he refuses, point blank, to believe. And I just ask the question, is that reasonable? Is that a wise way to live? I suppose it's possible to live your life like that, never really trusting anyone, never trusting anything. But I think we all recognize, don't we, when somebody is like that, that's a, that's a symptom of a disordered life, of a damaged life. That's not a sign of a balanced, healthy person. If you live like that, you'll never make friends, will you? Because... You don't trust that they might not someday let you down. You might refuse to marry because you can't trust that 
one day you won't be betrayed. I never want to have children just in case they, they grow up and they disappoint you. And on and on it goes. You see, you, in the end, if you live like that, you can't trust anyone except yourself. Of course, it's good to be honestly skeptical. It's good to demand to examine evidence. It's good to only want to commit to things that are credible and are true. And I think, by and large, we should be a lot more skeptical, especially if what's uh, all around us all the time in the media and the advertising world and the world of politics and so on. But that's quite different. It's quite different to be, to be pathologically foolish, to close your mind, to begin always with the presumption that some things are utterly impossible, cannot possibly be true, no matter who witnesses to you that it is true. If you go home tonight, you find in your email box an email that's come from Nigeria that promises you a million pounds from a totally unknown benefactor. Well, I suggest probably you don't trust that. Put it in your junk box if it's not there already. But supposing tomorrow morning you get a letter from a Glasgow solicitor telling you the news of a legacy from a relative that you do know, that's quite different, isn't it? It'd be rather foolish to throw that in the bin and ignore it. Even if you find yourself saying, I can't believe it. She couldn't stand me and I couldn't stand her. This is extraordinary. Well, sometimes, sometimes skepticism is roundly rebuffed by the evidence, isn't it? And you'd be wise to take note. And that's what happened to Thomas. We'll see that in a minute, but let's break for a moment and sing a lovely hymn about the, the glorious change that did come when up from the grave Jesus Christ arose.
you turn again to uh, John 20 and have a look at verses 26 and 27, because there we witness a great confrontation. Thomas the skeptic now rebuked by the evidence of the risen Jesus. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Exactly a week later, it's the eighth day inclusively, the following Sunday night. And still the disciples are meeting behind locked doors. They're afraid. What do you think the expression on Thomas's face was when Jesus said those things to him? You probably know if you've ever been in the position where you've wrongly disbelieved somebody or maybe you've been completely wrong about somebody, you've thought really ill of them and uh, you've been very angry about it and maybe you've accused them in doing some kind of wrongdoing against you or something like that. Maybe you've said all nasty things about that person. Maybe it's just been in your head or maybe it's even been to, to other people. And then you've discovered that you're completely wrong. And you realize that not only is what you thought wrong, but the truth is the exact opposite. Instead of wronging you, they've been incredibly kind to you, good to you. Well, you're overcome with a great sense of shame, aren't you? And you realize how irrational, perhaps, your, your belief had been to jump to all of those wrong conclusions, to think so wrongly, to think so unworthily, to cast aspirations on somebody in that way. And I'm sure that's how Thomas felt, sick, sick to the pit of his stomach. And perhaps we can empathize with that. Jesus appears there in verse 26 and says, peace. And everybody, no doubt, except for Thomas, leapt for joy. But Thomas just gaped in silence and he's rebuked by his own words, do you see, of unbelief. They're exposed by Jesus' words. Here's my hands, here's my side. Here's the things you want, Thomas. Don't disbelieve, but believe. Notice Jesus doesn't call Thomas a doubter. He's not doubting Thomas. He's a rank unbeliever. Jesus is rebuking him. Just as he rebuked the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, remember at the end of Luke's gospel, because they refused to believe the words of Scripture. Well, he rebukes Thomas here just the same for refusing to believe the words, the evidence of reliable, trustworthy, first-hand witnesses. You should have believed them. It's not healthy doubt that you've got, Thomas. It's culpable rejection of the truth. It's unbelief. It's wicked. And that's the truth. But Jesus is wonderfully merciful to Thomas. He does give him sight with his own eyes, touch with his own hands. And he sees that Jesus is risen indeed. And so verse 28 shows us, you see, remarkably, the great confession. We see Thomas the skeptic now rejoicing in the evidence. Thomas gives an outright confession, not only, notice, of Jesus' resurrection, but of his deity, my Lord and my God. And these words actually are the high point of the whole of the Gospel of John. The great cynic has become the great confessor, the greatest witness of them all in this Gospel. Just like later on, the, the great persecutor of the church, Saul of Tarsus, became the great preacher of the church, the greatest missionary of the church. When he saw the risen Lord Jesus and was rebuked by him, and many another great skeptic, many another opponent of the gospel right throughout history. St. Augustine in the fourth century, right through history to many of us perhaps sitting in this room this very day. What's the point of John recording all of this for us in this resurrection chapter? Well, look at verses 29 to 31 because that gives us the answer. Thomas becomes our teacher. He's the one that we're to pay heed to and learn not to scorn real and credible evidence about the truth of Jesus. 
You have believed because you have seen me, Jesus says to Thomas. Now, he's not deprecating that. The whole point of this whole chapter is that there was indeed irrefutable evidence, evidence that convinced even the most hardened skeptics, like Thomas, about the reality of the resurrection. But notice Jesus also says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And what Jesus means by that are made absolutely clear in the following two verses. And it sums up John's whole purpose in writing this gospel. Do you see verse 31? All these things, all this testimony is written so that you, that is all of you who hear and read these words, so that you may believe and find life in Jesus' name. Why is that important? Well, because Jesus was not going to remain bodily on this earth for much longer. I am ascending to my Father, he said to Mary in verse 17. So inevitably, it was going to be impossible, wasn't it, for anyone to believe on the truth about Jesus if they were to take Thomas's approach. Unless I see with my own eyes, I won't believe. Jesus is saying, that's going to be impossible until the day that I return, when every eye will see me. But then it'll be too late. And that day is coming. That day is coming for the whole world. Jesus says that earlier on in John's Gospel in chapter 5. But on that day, he says, only those who have believed in him now, through hearing his words and the testimony of his apostles and their gospel, only these will rise on that day to life. Those who have refused these words, they will rise only to judgment. Because these words, the words of the apostles, the eyewitnesses who testify to Jesus, these words are the legal tender of salvation. These words are the currency of life. These are the words backed by the promise of the issuer, God Almighty himself. And in the upper room, the night before his death, Jesus prayed for all his own, not just his first followers, but he says, for all who will also believe on me through their words, their testimony. And he said to the 12, you will bear witness. And he said, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And of course, likewise, whoever rejects and disbelieves and doesn't trust the word of the one he sends, or rejects and disbelieves Jesus himself. If you short sell a country's currency, as some of the older ones here will remember, George Soros so famously did to the British pound in 1992. If you short sell a country's currency, you're heaping scorn on that nation's government, on its sovereignty, on its strength, on its power on its competence. It's a slap in the face. It's a concrete expression of distrust and disbelief in the power of the issuer. And you see, in just the same way, if you short sell the currency of Christ, the gospel of Christ, the promissory note of the gospel, then you're heaping scorn, you're heaping rejection on the sovereign Lord himself can't have the the life of God. You can't have the life that God promises in the gospel, the, the resurrection life from the dead beyond the grave along with Jesus. You can't have that if you if you reject the gospel of God, the word of trust that God has given. You reject his currency of life, you you reject him. Because the currency of the gospel, like all currency, just as the professor says, is a matter of belief. Belief in the person who lies behind the currency, belief in its guarantor. The Christian gospel is trust inscribed. It is the genuine first-hand witness and testimony of the apostles who were with Jesus from the very beginning, who saw him with their own eyes, who touched his risen body. Listen to what John the apostle who wrote this, listen to what he wrote later in his first letter to the church. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands, 
concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life. It was with the Father and which was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you. Thomas rejected out of hand at the beginning what later proved him to have been so very wrong. And Jesus is saying to us, and John is saying to us in this gospel, don't be like that. You're blessed if you believe what he heard and what he should have believed, and you believe. Don't say, I will never believe. It's amazing how many people, how many intelligent people do that. Don't do that, says John. Now examine the evidence. Take time to weigh it up. Ask questions. What's there to lose? Come back here next week and hear more. We're not desperate. We're not going to brainwash you. We're supremely confident in our currency, in the word of life entrusted to us in this gospel of Jesus. We want you to examine it freely for yourself so that you don't lose out. Come to our life course. Examine the evidence. Read the Bible for yourself. Have an open mind. Be open-minded enough to say this. Pray to God and say, Lord, if you are real, if you are risen, I'll open my eyes, open my mind, so that I, even though, even though up to now I've been a skeptic, so that I too might become not a cynic anymore, but a great confessor of Christ, to know you as my Lord and my God. If you're not a Christian, I dare you to pray that prayer. What have you got to lose? Ultimately, the only way to see what a currency is really worth is to take it into your own hands and try it out and discover what it will bring you. Isn't that right? Well, says John here in verse 31, that's what this gospel currency is for. All of this is written. It's inscribed in trust so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I pray that that might be so for all who hear these words this Easter day, so that you also will, will leave tonight singing, my hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. Amen.
My name is Isabel Murray. I was born in Glasgow and I came to the Tron in 1965. I can't remember a time when I didn't love Jesus. And Bible stories were read to me. I was prayed with. I would see my mum reading her Bible and praying. And she would teach me to pray. So I always loved Jesus. There was never a time that I didn't. And I always wanted to follow him and be the best that I could be. And from a very young age, I wanted to be a missionary and to go to Africa. Well, my dream came true <laughs> in a different way, not in the continent of Africa, but took me to Asia because I married Ian, who was a missionary in Thailand, and he said, will you marry me and will you come to Thailand? And so we, I went to Thailand with him for several years. And that was wonderful as well in many ways. Just again, seeing how God took somebody who had been broken and in his gentleness and kindness built me up. It was wonderful, amazing. But he's an amazing God, isn't he? He's just showered so much on me, given me so much that I would never, ever, ever have dreamt of. And when I think of Easter, you know, I think of the Lord coming to this earth and knowing that the purpose of him coming was to go and to die. I just think in the, again and again of the agony and what it meant for him and yet what joy it brought because it's not the end. His death is not the end because he rose from the dead. He defeated death. And that is the wonderful thing. My husband Ian died several years ago and not long before he died, we were talking about um, funerals. And I remember he said to me, you know, is he said, when I die, when the Lord takes me to be with him, I will be with him and I will be able to dance before the Lord. I will no longer have my gammy leg. He said, I'll be whole. And I thought about this and I thought, yes, he's whole. I miss him, of course, but he's whole. And that to me is the hope of the resurrection. I just think of the Lord Jesus Christ and he died for me. He took my sin on the cross of Calvary. And I'm getting older and one day I'll die, but I will be alive because I'll be with him. And that is the hope. To me, death is not the end. What a savior I have, a wonderful savior. And I don't know the half of it.
Well, we've heard this evening about the evidence at the very heart of the Christian message. We've heard wonderful words of testimony from Joe and from Izzy, uh, wonderful, beautiful words about what the Lord Jesus means to them. We've heard these beautiful words sung to us by the choir. We've sung ourselves great words about the Lord Jesus Christ. And perhaps this is all very new for you. Uh, maybe this is your first time visiting a church. Well, we'd love to have you here. You're very welcome. And uh, we'd love for you to consider these things further, to look at the evidence for yourself, as Willie has been speaking about. Christianity is not a leap into the darkness. Uh, far from it. It is a faith based on evidence and real events in history. And we would encourage you to look into these things further uh, for yourself. And two things that we'd love to invite you to. Uh, one is our regular church services here, week by week. Uh, come here next week, same time, same place, 5 p.m. And uh, we'll be doing the same sort of thing, singing praise to God, reading his words, hearing it taught. And we also meet in the mornings, every Sunday morning, 10 a.m., across our three different venues. And you're very welcome. We'd love to have you along. And uh, we'd uh, very much welcome you along to our weekly Sunday services. Uh, there's a welcome desk at the back. You can find out more information there about our regular Sunday gatherings. But please, uh, come along any Sunday. We'd love to see you here. The second thing to mention is uh, what Willie alluded to in the talk about our upcoming life course. Our life course is a five-week introduction to the Christian faith in a relaxed environment, an opportunity for you to ask your questions. Now, who is Jesus? Uh, what did he come to do? What is a Christian? And all are welcome, especially if you're new to the Christian faith, if you're investigating things. Maybe you're returning to church after many years. Uh, or maybe this is all totally new. You've got no idea what it's about. You're curious. Well, the life course is a great place to come and I would love to invite you to that. Uh, the course starts on Wednesday, the 24th of April, 7.30 p.m. at our Bar Street building. If you head to the website, details are on the back of your handouts there, your flyers. Uh, have a look at there, check out the website. You see all the information you need there. You can book in, and we'd love to see you there. And it's helpful for us to know if you're coming, so we can have enough baking. The baking is immense. It's the best in Glasgow, so come for the baking, if not for anything else. And many, many folk have found the life course really helpful over the last few years. So do come. And if you're a regular here, bring your friends. Uh, you know about it. But come to church. Come to life. We'd love you to investigate these things further. Well, let's sing together to conclude our service. We sing a great hymn, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun. Let's sing together.
God of light, Father of life, giver of wisdom, benefactor of our souls, who gives to the faint-hearted who put their trust in you those things into which the angels desire to look. O sovereign Lord, who has brought us from the depths of darkness to light, who has given us life from death, who has graciously bestowed upon us freedom from slavery, and who has scattered the darkness of sin within us. Also enlighten the eyes of our understanding and sanctify us wholly in soul, body, and in spirit. We ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.